technical problems here. So we're going to start the meeting. We uh, don't have a big crowd here. There's uh, an issue going. There's a, another event going on at the MAC Center that uh, they're expecting 150 people and they all have parking spots. So um, tonight we're going to have Mike. And we don't have, I guess we have a few show and tell stuff. Do I need a show and Let's do show and tell, and we'll have a little talk here, and then we'll, we'll call out for pizza. <laughs> Who wants to do show and tell? Well, I'm I'm, I'm I'm standing here, so I'll do it. Okay. All right. So these are Roger. Yeah. You've been playing with your. So the black one is uh, India ink. And the main thing on these poles, I, I work on the rim so you have a, a handhold on the rim. M&M &M style. Yeah. And the red one is uh, a die. And I dyed it. Uh, right. I, I carved it first and then dyed it. And I should have let the die. Uh, that a little bit longer because uh, when I first put it on, it, it didn't go into the uh, car part, and then after a while, it did. Was so it next time I do it, I'm going to try and uh, see alcohol, alcohol based, based on or water based. Or... It's uh, alcohol based. I'm surprised that didn't penetrate better. It's pretty. It's a nice color. And the third one is just a uh, wow. different color, starting with black, and then. Uh, Red and then uh, yellow. And this is the old maple Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. That's, pretty. That's like an exotic. Yes. Yeah, it's a very exotic look. And then, uh, and then, uh, it's not a tourney, but I took a, a, a two day carving class uh, from Mary May, who's pretty famous in the carving industry with the relief carving. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did on this is one of the first things you do in carving is lay it out. If you flip it around the back, flip, flip it, it over. Back. Mike, flip it around. Oh. <laughs> so I used uh, my CNC machine with a laser uh, <laughs> on it to uh, put the uh, diagram on there and then uh, car started carving from there. So oh, that's a CNC carving. Yeah. Well, well, it's a CNC laid out, but he actually hand carved it. So this is like the the paint by number camera Lucida, the, the hidden camera. You look through the lens and it projects an image onto your. Uh, you use a, a software package called VCar laid out, and then draw the uh, router bit in the router and put a laser uh, and it just draws whatever your diagram. Is. And that's how this started. Yeah. That's how it started. From such meager origins. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. If you ever have a chance to take a class from her, she's a, uh, a great teacher. Yeah, and back in the pen business. She uh, brought the pen. I did. Roger, yes. Another uh, Roger. Mike, are we okay? um, so there's, there's, a, a, uh, there's a little story here, here and then a tie in tonight's, tonight's presentation. presentation. This, this is the pen I started at last month's um, workshop. Mm -hmm. I never got it done. Uh, Steve helped me quite a bit. He's got an awesome uh, bedside, shall I say, lady <laughs> side manner. Uh, and Mike, you helped me bust a yeah. few myths on uh, tool sharpening, so that was nice. So anyway, I was able to get this done. Tie in, I think, here is um, this is a big leaf maple, right? So it's um, colored and stabilized with uh, uh, green malachite guy in uh, Texas, Texas shoes, shoes mm -hmm. right? So it's a heat, if you're not familiar with it, it's a heat setting, penetrating, uh, stabilizing material. Uh, and then these are all our alternative materials that I thought might be a good tie in for tonight. Um, that one is aluminum, obviously. Uh, I wanted a bright finish on that. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, as soon as you take it off the lathe, uh, you start developing a patina, just handling it and setting it down anyway. Uh, aluminum is too soft, mm. but it started off with nice. That's a beautiful mirror. Look up to the camera, Mike. That's a beautiful mirror. Oh, yeah, that's a Schmidt. Uh, mm -hmm. Epic 462B or something like that. Is that an ink pan? Uh, fountain. Fountain, fountain, fountain pan. pan. 
And then um, uh, that one is uh, Aqua Pearl. Mm -hmm. uh, Penn State Aqua Pearl. There's nothing pearl about it. It's an interesting name. It's just a nice jet black material. Um, I thought it to see how it would turn out, but um, again, it's not pearl at all. So I'm going to call it that. Uh, this, this one is also aqua pearl, the same family of, of um, blanks, and that was the first one I made. These are all uh, kits with the fountains, and I wanted to see if the, if the plastic would thread, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and, and it's, it's done really well. I've had that out for a long time. A few people have sampled it, you know, and done work with it, and, it, and the threads held up, so um, I really like that. Um, this, this black one... Um, would have been really typical of what an original fountain looked like, right? Uh, uh, they were all uh, vulcanized rubber, and in that shape, they would have been um, in the early, uh, early last century, they would have been pretty much all black, uh, which is an excellent um, segue to this pen. It's ebonite, and it is uh, vulcanized rubber. So uh, it's, it's really interesting. If you guys get a chance to come up and pick the pants up, You'll note that the ominosity of the aluminum is going to be cold, and this one's going to feel warm. So it's really interesting. Mm. So please touch. If you guys have used fountains, yeah. I'd really appreciate any feedback, comments. <laughs> the plastics thread very well. Are those are those all kitless? Well, it was, yeah. the, the, the green, green one, one is just a two piece seven, seven millimeter, millimeter, you know, slip on, slip on, yeah. yeah. And, and then these, these are all uh, kitless, yes. yes. So, just another question where do you get your components for the kitless? Um, so, I it, unfortunately, the guy's website is um, no longer available. He retired, but I was buying the NIBS. Uh, the nib quill assemblies from a guy that unfortunately out of business. And uh, the, the current pricing on these is a lot different than what I paid for. He's basically selling what he had to go on. Right. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, uh, the fountain uh, pen and being sort of the buggy whip of the, uh, yeah, mod, of the, the technology, technology era. era. Right. And, and the fountain, and, um, a big part of what you see in the fountain is that nib quill. So yeah. uh, there are a lot of line, though. The, the rest of the material I have. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but these are just Penn State um, pen and likes. The aluminum I bought uh, from a local um, distributor, uh, they started out as uh, just aluminum rod. Um, and then the step nine I got online. Uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in this material. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone is interested, take a look. It's hard to see in this light, but there's actually a blue. Um, Ripple uh, through the material. This is a custom sample that a friend of mine actually gave me that he made uh, custom, but there's a site online that you can buy that material and it's available in multiple different colors. So, all in black. anyway, I'm curious if anyone's interested in me having to talk to you about that. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. Oh, thanks. Very nice. Actus juice stabilized pieces, they turn pretty well. Um, I I, I think, think so. So, so this is that pen that we started. started. So I think you actually were working it a little bit. Now, now this is big leaf maple, so it was never really a funky material to start with. But I have turned uh, stabilized, uh, really salty Norway maple. And what, when you're when you're done with it, you know, when it's done stabilizing, it's hard. I can bring you some samples. I tried to turn some of that stabilized, multi-layered colored plastic that has kind of. Mm. Rainbow color, it's super brittle, oh, just yeah. chips all the pieces. Yep. yep. What was that, the Ford I? Um, the one that has multiple color layers. The, the plywood the sort of stuff? Yeah, laminated plywood. Yeah, that, that is. It's nasty. No. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've successfully turned it, but it's not hooked. No. Yeah, yeah, I would never do it again, even though it did turn out okay. <laughs> yeah, it was a Christmas present, so I had to do it. <laughs> I had such a gentle hand, it just chipped the pieces. Yeah. yeah. Next. Well, the other the other pieces we have are things that I brought to sort of show off what you can do with um, the hybrid blanks. The um, in this case, the Lumalite. The last is it last month or month before last? We saw the ebony turning, which I think may have left kind of a bad taste in everyone's mouth about the. Uh, 
the use of, of hybrid blanks. But these are, you know, this is alumilite, which is my plastic material of choice. And we'll talk about the plastics. This is uh, um, black locust burl. It's like an eyeball. Yeah. And nice. this is. Where are you? There, there you are. This is buckeye burl. Just surrounded by the uh, alumilite clear and turned into a sear. The things you can do with it, you can make, you know, since you are dealing with a, a, a material that's very readily colored, you can make all manner of things. Don't forget to make things for the wife. She likes them too. Um, th these are from when you, uh, when you, you make, make a pepper, pepper mill, mill, you got to square the bottom. bottom. So you, you put, put it on the chop saw, you chop off a little piece of the bottom, bottom, you got this, you know, three by three, three by uh, three eight 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 pieces of stuff. And this is what, what you can, can do with it. So you basically mounting the little yeah. cap ring. Right. And, and they're, they're very pretty. pretty. Nothing goes, goes away from the winter. winter. Um, just just playing, playing with color and wood. It's, it's fun. fun. Right? You can, this is, is a uh, buckeye burl, burl and just red and blue white. Uh, this is the black with white, white stirred into it. This is the what you get. These you can make use for, at well, least they can wind up tenants, they can wind up as toasters, and you know, that's waste material anyway. So, what do you want to do? It's fun to experiment with. What's the white stuff? Uh, the white stuff is, is, is a little white that's, that's got, got a white dye in it. Black and then just a red translucent. So are those pieces all from a larger piece or do you do uh, the individual say by, I don't know, four by four by half inch thick or do you do a larger mold? Uh, no, these, these came all of, of um, I, I, don't I don't think, think of the bottom of the pepper, pepper mills, but they, they were like a box. box. They were three by three, three by six. six. I, I think I'm going to make a box out of them. And then of course the Ever present model stopper, stopper which, which is great fun, fun to make, and they sell very well at the uh, the garage shows. And you're, you, you got, got nothing in them. them. I mean, there's, there's no, no more wood there. there. I was going to say you you spent more on the stopper portion. Yes, yes. Yeah. Very, oh, very, very clearly. clearly. Yes. yes. Is the center one dyed green? Or yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, dyeing the aluminum is, is one of the best things, things about it. it. The aluminite dyes have very good color saturation and very predictable. So you're using yeah. the aluminite brand aluminite dyes. Brand dyes. Yeah. And How do you get it light dyes. enough? I've, I've, I always end up with really, really dark. <laughs> you, can bowl, which you, you can make, make a bowl, bowl out of anything. Yeah, there was, it was a piece of uh, big leaf rural that was just laying around and throwing with some green stuff. stuff and, I think that was one of the first pieces that I think about. Anyway, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what, what you can do. do. With, with the hybrid materials. materials. Um, tonight, tonight I want to talk a little bit about the, the other hybrid, hybrid, materials. hybrid materials. And, and then, then we have a movie that I made mean, actually for the, the club down, down in, in, in Salem. Um, they, they wanted me to bring all my stuff, stuff down to show how, how you stabilize wood and how you, you know, put the little light together, together and put it in the pressure chamber and turn it. And I said, well, no, that's not happening. So, so I kind of made a video, video of it, and then took one of the pieces that I made the video and made the bottle of it. And we're going to see the bottle of the movie tonight, because uh, it's easier to show people how this happens than it is to try to explain it. It's really very simple, simple. and it's, it's not terribly expensive, and it's, it's a, a fun thing to do, a fun diversion. Because when you're thinking about these, um, you're thinking about, about these hybrid planks, you're now thinking about not just figure and grade, you're thinking about color and composition. And where do you want all this to, how do you want it all to go together? Uh, and things turned out a little bit better. This was means I was going to start turning for you. 
And if you look, look at this, you can see we got you know, four big pieces of what was I think black book or uh, uh, big leaf maple salted stuff. But there, there are no pieces in here big enough to actually do anything. anything. But to put them all together, now we've got a, a, a 12 by 3 inch block that will turn it into a, a very nice bowl or a, a big bit of platters. You know, they're, uh, they're very practical pieces of waterproof utility here, but these are really are more for show. Uh, I'm going to show you about the Greeks. The Greek needle, needle plate, plate, which is how I hold these on the way, but there'll be, be another, another day with that. Uh, put it in a pressure pot? Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to see the process. Okay, one big pressure pot. I was going to say, that's yeah. a good sized pressure pot. Well, well actually, actually, it's the same one I have all the time. You, you think, think it, if you're going to get that into a pot, okay, you think, think about a pot sitting on the floor. Well, uh, the pot of that guy you know. I, I, I couldn't pop, I couldn't really have a hard time getting, getting a hole that big into it. But, but if you mount that on the wall, so if you're going into it like an oven, you can suddenly get much bigger pieces into it easier than you can in the So uh, that started out as a, um, um, a, a hexagonal mold, uh, just about an inch bigger than that. that uh, uh, Hot, hot glue the wood to the edge of the hole. Made, made, made up the little I poured it in, put it inside, inside the pressure pot, and hope it didn't leak. leak. <laughs> and and it's it's going to be, be very pretty, and eventually we'll see, we'll see the outcome of this. Now, now I, did, I had some slides, slides uh, prepared to talk, talk about, about this. We talked about, about um, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid lights. lights. There are really, really three basic materials besides the wood. Uh, people make, make hybrid blanks out of the poppy, make, make hybrid blanks out of the acrylic, and make hybrid blanks out of the light. Now, now, the difference is, I'm figuring you're missing the molecular structures, but actually, the structures, if you just look at the images, they tell you a lot about the way the material behaves. For example, acrylic is a bunch of tightly not little bits. Strung together, together by very, very thin molecular chains. Well, you would expect, expect that to be sort of brittle. You would expect that to come off in chunks, little chunks, chunks which is what it does. does. Acrylic is very brittle, it's very thermal wave file, so you have to be careful not to overheat it. And you need to cover yourself in, in, in you know, a little wool rug because it's going to come flying off of there and it's hot and it hurts. So I'm not, not a big acrylic fan. The advantage of the acrylic is very cheap. Um, you, you can, can do, do a lot, lot of color mixing, mix. and so you, you can get some very, very dramatic colors, but it's, it's just a pain in the butt to, to turn, turn and to finish, finish because, because as you're standing, standing you, have you have to be very careful about um, overheating. A epoxy, epoxy, if we were looking at the structure of, of an epoxy resin, we would see small little groups of molecular density. But they're, they're tied, tied together, together with a little bit more substantial strings than the acrylic was. So, so it's going to break off into chunks, chunks, but it's, it's not going to fall apart quite as easily. So the epoxy is tougher, tougher not as brittle as acrylic. Um, it's, it's a little more thermal light file, and that it's more sensitive to heat, so you have to be very careful not to overheat it. Um, but, but it's going to turn a little better, a little smoother than the acrylic. The third variety, the alumite. Alumite is a polyurethane derivative. Um, and if I think back to what we talked about polyurethane, we talked about varnishes. The polyurethanes are sort of long filament structures. And if you look at the structure of alumite, it looks surprisingly like cellulose. Long filaments that actually bend. So, so you would expect, expect that a little light first of all would not chip the way that a girl like a epoxy is. And it would be more flexible, which, which is what you find. Um, so, so the little light is a much easier resin to work with, and it's, it's not as sensitive to heat. So you don't have to be quite as careful about, about um, 
um, heating up and melting. One of the other things that, that comes up about this is cost. Unlike, Unlike almost everything else I can think of, the cost of aluminum has come down in the last few years. <laughs> people, people are buying more of it and they sell it for less and sell more. Um, but, but it used to be, be and I, I think, think in, the, in the movie I put it here, 40 cents a cubic inch, it's now, now down to about 25 to 35 cents a cubic inch. Comparing that to um, all, oh, let's say, desert, desert iron wood, which is 380 a cubic inch, or East Indian hardwood, which is dollar 80 a cubic inch, even cherry is about 24 cents a cubic inch. So, so it's like, like turning a not, not really expensive wood. It's, it's, it's not as cheap as the name of your carbon pile, but the cost of the aluminum is not a tremendous drag. So, so how, how do we do these things? Well, we're we'll going to start out with an idea. idea. We're going to start out with the color we want. We're going to start out with the wood that's been prepared. Now, now it's, it's true of all of the hybrid, hybrid, um, hybrid planks, planks that all of these plastics will sit to the dry wood, wood pieces of the wood and have them into the water. You put it under pressure, you put it, the, the water is going to boil out. Um, if the wood is dry, you're just going to get a better wood. You're going to get clearer plastic, you're going to get better adhesion to the surface than you would with a wet piece of wood. So, all the wood that I use has been dried at about 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 hours. That's enough to dry it out. So, then we, we're going to need a mold. You can use anything anything you have that's, that's mold. That's the same thing you want. Um, when I, when I close, close my lab down, if there's anything that has dust on it, um, then there was a lot of plexiglass that had dust, dust on it. So that, that all came over with me. I should have taken it and gone. It's in the rock, so it just dusted everything. I don't, I don't, I don't miss the work. I do miss the toys. Um, so, so I have lots of plexiglass to work with. So I have all that I need to bring out of plexiglass. Uh, with um, screw, screw pass with the removable hands and his solvent uh, joint. And you can make, I think about flex glass, you can make it at any point just about any size. And if you get the whole joint together, put a drop of chloroform on the outside, we'll allow your cement. It's very easy to work with, very easy to uh, fabricate. So, so we've, we've got, got a hole, we've got an idea, idea we've got, got a color, we've got a wood we're going to use. Um, the, the, um, the stabilization of the wood, that's, that's the part that requires the, the vacuum chamber. You'll see all of this. The setting of the aluminum requires pressure because the aluminum is two part, two part, part solution. So it's exothermic, it gives off heat. Generates bubbles. Well, well 60 psi, psi those bubbles are forced right, right back in into the solution. So, so you don't, don't see bubbles in your, in your picture. But but having said, said that, let's see if we can get, get something, something to work tonight. tonight. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, well, um, I really don't know. I guess I can narrate it. <laughs> what the hell? Are you playing on your uh, internal speakers?
I honestly do not understand. Nope. Anyway, what we're looking at here, <laughs> we're getting ready to um, stabilize in the little vacuum chamber. It used to be a, mi a microbial growth chamber. This is the cactus juice produced by Curtis down there in Texas, where everything is a cactus or a longhorn. And in the, in the chamber, uh, what we have is the pieces we're going to stabilize. Um, a little piece of black, a big leaf maple that's going to go into our our um, our stabilized pieces. And there's some spalted alder in there and uh, other pieces that are very punky that the cactus juice is going to um, harden in and allow us to use. Vacuum. This is a vacuum. This is it's a a plastic, a heat heat stabilized plastic. It's made by Turntex Company. Um, we're going to see that that after I quit talking here for a minute, uh, we're going to put a, a piece of of lead lined with rubber on top of that because they still have air in it and they're going to float if we don't weigh them down. There we go. There's the, and we'll cover that with cactus juice. Price per gallon of the cactus juice is about three dollars a gallon. It's and and what what doesn't get absorbed into the wood goes back in the bottle. Dollars a gallon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Eighty dollars a gallon. Try right, eighty. Cactus juice. Yeah. yeah. Would you like the address from the guy I get it from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 80 for my last I haven't I haven't bought any for a while, but it, I didn't think it was that expensive. But you know, a gallon will so now it's pissed off about being talked over. Come on. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so you draw a vacuum on it, and there we go. There comes the air out of the wood. Now this this has this chamber has a valve on it, so that if it gets to start bubbling up too far, I'll just break the vacuum, brought the bubbles, and and you know let it let it go like this. Um, you just let it go for as long as you forget about it. I usually go away and get busy doing something else, and when you come back, the bubbles will have stopped. That's all the air that's going to be extracted. Uh, my my vacuum pump will get right close to 30 inches of mercury. It's a good pump. If you can get 25, you can do the you can do the cactus juice. That's enough vacuum. It takes longer, but it will get the job done. So at 30, how long do you leave it in? Uh, two hours is usually enough. It depends on the size of the like. This is a a one gallon anaerobic chamber. Um, I've got a, a 20 gallon tub that once it gets down to vacuum, it goes at the same rate. So the, the vacuum extraction of air is independent of size. It's easier to see the bubbles though on the small one. And that's what you're looking for. You can see we're we're up to about 25 with that. Time passes. Hardening during this. No, it's not. No. All it's doing, now watch. Watch the liquid level. That's the, the wood sucking up the cactus juice as you relieve the vacuum. There we go. Um, it's a it's a, a hydroxy radical generator because the plastic is is radical polymerized. 
Um, it's funny stuff. It, it, it should harden in the jug, but it doesn't. So I think what they've, they've tuned it to just enough, just enough of the, the hardening radical generator that if you put it under a little bit of stress, like under a vacuum or under heat, you will get it to, to harden. It's not a two-part like No, it's a it's a little tiny bottle and a and a, a gallon jug. And in theory, once you put the little thing in there, you got the, the clock starts ticking. It does, but I've used it for up to a year. You know, at the end of the end of the life expectancy, you you look at it in the oven, and if you see that it's still sort of oozing, let it go a little bit longer. So the vacuum process just takes the air out of it. And then takes it, the air out of it and puts the puts the cactus juice, juice in. And then you have to let it sit somewhere. Then it's going into the oven here. Um, so do you ever use a dye with the cactus juice? Yes. Um, I take it as toxic. No, it's not. It, I will go, as I actually say in the movie, I'm going to go wash my hands as soon as I finish here. But it's not, you know, it's not particularly dangerous. Yeah, the cactus juice will will take the a dive fairly deep into the wood, but getting but getting a a, a density to get the color you want is yeah. is hard with cactus yeah. juice. It's it's hard to get it dark enough. To right, get it. right. How hot is your oven? Um, one hundred eighty degrees. Which type of oven is that? I use it. I, it's I, I it's use a, a precision I, lab oven. <laughs> I use a smoke, I use a deep smoker. Yep. That was a uh, like I said when I when I closed my lab, everything with dust on it was mine. That had some dust on it, so it came home with me. There's our piece we're gonna actually put into the uh, the alumilite. And what I'm saying is, what I'll do is go and and sand it off, even it up. Now there's one of the plexiglass. Um, plexiglass molds, you can see the end is, yeah, there we go. You can see the end is gasketed with bolts, and the other joints are just uh, chloroform seal. You have to coat the mold with anything? Yep. Do you use soda? No, I use a, a, um, a mold release, a spray. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you brushing? To get the, the any bits of dust off the surface, uh, bits of cactus juice that have come to the top and, and crystallized. Um, it goes into the, the oven and it'll take a day. So someone might have asked the question and you answered it. I just missed it. Um, as far as the shelf life of the cactus juice, if you use it over and over again, what kind of things do you look for to say, oh, it's time to move on to a new batch? Or um, you'll you'll see that it it doesn't harden as quickly as it should. You know, it, with a new batch of cactus juice, if you look at it after two hours, you'll see there are hard crystals on the surface of the wood. Okay. If it's if it's losing its zip. Um, you may have to wait six hours before you see those. Does it have to be stored any special way if you don't do a lot of this? In the dark and in the in the dark and in the cool. Okay. Yeah, I keep it on the garage floor under the bench. Okay, so now we're getting ready to mix up the alumilite, and alumilite comes as a part A and a part B. It, uh... He's trying to figure out the box. Yeah. <laughs> you were spraying that mold with, is that a release agent? That's a release agent, right. Now, to calculate how much aluminite you need, um, I use glass beads. You can use rice, you can use lentils, anything that'll fill up that uneven space. Yeah, yep. And then just put it into a measuring cup a graduated cylinder, that and that's how, huh? <laughs> it had dust on it too. You can see it still does. Uh, 
has about 165 mils of glass beads there. So they have a little extra. I'll make up 180 mils of alumilite. So 90A, 90B. The color is going to go into the A, um, the A component. There we have alumilite clear, uh, A and B. You know, no, I use clear. So you don't add the color until after, or be, use color before you mix the two? You, uh, I'll put the color into the A side huh. because my the my colors are, uh, the alumilite dyes diluted into the A. Now, I've, I've found over the years in the lab that it's just easier to work from liquid stocks whenever you can. It's easier to pipette than to measure. So we got 90, 90 mils of A, 90 mils of B, and you notice they're actually it's actually on a scale. So when I'm I'm measuring a volume, but I'm also calculating measuring the weight. So I'm just dispersing the dye by weight. Uh, what we have is um, well, this is my my standard sea sea green, um, which is 50 mils of or 50 drops of alumilite in 500 alumilite dye in 500 mils of A. Now that will that's stable forever. Huh. And what I, what I, yeah. And I know that, that if I put, I have a whole series of colors. It says X drops per mil of A gives you that color. I pick a color that I want. That's how much I add to it. Is that trial and error? Or is there a chart like that? Well, I have a chart now because I made it. <laughs> they started playing with it. And I thought, you know, what I learned was that the alumilite dyes are very reproducible. They're, the color is very dependable. And if I decide I want a color between two standards that I know about, I can calculate and it will come close enough for me. So say again why you weigh it instead of just on measuring? It's a weight, it's a, it's weight. weight. yeah, it's a weight, not a volume. So the A and the B are different? Yeah, Wait. yeah. And the dye is very heavy. So the the weight and volume of that is very much out of proportion with everything else. Uh, my cow tongue depressor is, <laughs> is actually from a company that sells everything you need for airplane maintenance. Um, and it's a, a, a sanded and, and finished piece of, uh, of maple that's very cheap and uh, works very well. Alumilite is very viscous. You got to mix the bejesus out of it. Um, and that means that you need something, a stir bar of, of some size. Um, and these just work just fine. I'm telling you the same thing I just told you, but I don't know why it's taking me so long here. As opposed to what I just said. So, going to get a piece of tape to hold that piece of wood in the mold. And the dye is put in. Um, at this stage, if you don't like the color, the color you see there is pretty close to the color you're going to get. So, if you want something a little bit different, you can still tweak it at this stage with a drop of this or that. I'm going to put some of my stain. Yeah, well, I'm going to put a little bit more of the green, uh, my standard green. Well, that's this blue, you know, it's sea blue. It's got a little green in it. I wanted a little more green. What's your open timer? About eight minutes. And it, that's not a... If you got at the first time, it's not near enough. But after that, you know what you're supposed to be doing. So you've got the pressure chamber ready. You've got everything you need ready to go. And it really is, is plenty of time. I I use the... Yeah. Um, if you feel it getting hot in your hand, just throw it away and start over it because it's not, it's not going anywhere for you. Uh, it, it is a, a fairly existential process. You can see the the bubbles, maybe. 
There's a few of them. It generates a lot is, of bubbles. <laughs> is that just a plastic uh, cup you're using? Yes. Yes. Huh. Yep. I have all, all manner of mixing vessels, all the way from the, you know, the Saturday afternoon kegger beer cup, which works just fine, to the theater popcorn container for, you know, that that mass of uh, alumilite. You don't want to use something you plan to wash because it does not wash out very well. Well, you know, you see these places that sell you all the graduated, you know, beakers or whatever and stuff like that. I'm thinking, gosh, I add up to a lot after a while. Well, yeah, you see the epoxy. Um, if the mixing epoxy, there are differential mixing with epoxy. So the measured, the graduated container is useful. Um, with this, there's no, it's one to one. It's weight to weight. You calculate weight, you know, 90 mils or 90 grams of uh, B is going to be X number of mils and you mix it together and there you go. What were you doing for that pipe in? That was more green. Uh, yeah, it was more green. I wanted. It looked like it was long. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The pasting that just push the. You know, push the it's a very thick dye, huh? Yeah. Well, you can see how viscous the alumilite is. Pulled something out of there. Yeah. I don't remember what that was, but I just was, I was very sure it didn't belong there. Yeah, I think it's probably a piece of this. <laughs> and here we go. You pour it in, you pour it slowly, make sure that, that you don't get any bubbles caught anywhere. The, the, the mold is a little bit oversized. I'm going for one and a half by one and a half by about two and a half in my, my finished, um, Um, finished pieces. Yeah, it's going to become two actually. So, Mike, do you ever pour in some from one color and then? Yeah. From... Now, at at this point, you can add the mica chips. You can add the if you have clouds, you want to put, you know, the white lumilite in there to make the clouds over the the blue lagoon. If you want to put in any sort of metallic um material this is where this is when you do it you gotta go through all that mixing to, to get that to do that right? yep why did you uh put that piece of tape on there to keep the wood from floating up now we're going to my my pressure pot is just an old uh painter's spray can uh yep find a find a painter that's going out of business and he'll, if you'll take it off his hands, he'll probably give it to you. Uh, you can buy them now. One, this, this is a five gallon compressor can. It's oh, California, California, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. 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 It's it's going to get as soon as this goes under pressure. This is setting as we as we speak. Um, it's not going to stay liquid for an hour. It's going to stay thick as it was. Yet, and you have to stir the mica chips into it. They're not going to settle on their own, and it's going to get hard before they move very much distance at all. Okay. Yeah. I, when I did mica in, in one of mine, I actually mixed it in just before I poured it. And yeah. I I I know people they'll put it in the bottom of their mold and they'll pour the stuff in so you, you you get swirls sometimes but it's already in there and you can move it around as you want. The clouds are the hard part. <laughs> to get a get a good cloud uh I found out I, 60 psi. I find that if you put it in the the white aluminum light in a pipette and actually blow it extrude it into the stuff and just trail it through the the, uh, the dark color, it works real well. And that's it. Go away. The mica does what? Pardon? The mica does what? It makes it shine. 
it, it, it's it's a it's a just a secondary decorative item. So, you have eight so all that. yeah, and you'd be surprised after you do it the first time. You say, "Okay, this is really not hard." Okay, so how long? So it will sit anywhere from an hour till the next morning when you remember you got it going. Yeah, I usually do it overnight. Yeah, it's but it's something that something that size. An hour, two hours is plenty. So with regard to the talking about making clouds, if you don't get good at it, does it just look like a fog? <laughs> yes. You, okay. It's a fog bank instead of a cloud bank. Okay. And then uh, the other question I had was the um, uh, size of your pressure uh, air, pressure tank to maintain. I mean, I've just got a little pancake type thing. Is that going to work out for me? Oh, sure. Okay. All you got to do is get it up to 60 or 50 or 60 pounds per square inch, and then you close the tank off. You're not constantly maintaining pressure. Gotcha. How come you didn't make the aluminum like the Didn't want it to. He didn't mix, it, he didn't mix, it <laughs> mix enough because I'm going to wind up cutting off that edge to get it to the right size. Is the bolt just flexible? Uh, yeah, three eighths. You it's can really use like the slippery HP, whatever type stuff too, right? Yeah, that'll do. Okay. Then I'd put in a block of plexiglass at the end to take up space too, so I didn't have to you use. Can, you can also get silicon molds. Yeah. With craft or... Except they're expensive. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you can you can get the putty and make your own too. And the guy that sells them is a bit of a dick. So, yeah. Yeah. Laguna or lizard. Lizard, yeah. Actually, used to work up a woodcraft. Anyway, so all I got to do is trim that down now to uh, two. Oh, you got two. Like, how long does it, you know, you're talking about taking it out after, let's say you leave it in overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but until, Full cure. What are you talking about? I mean, it's it's done. Yeah, these are. I've had problems. Maybe I didn't have the mix right. Yeah. Had it be soft for like a couple of days. Now, a somewhat older picture, as you can tell, <laughs> is up at Les's shop. I'm going to turn a a, a little stopper there. The the squared around with this is the hard, hardest thing about it. It'll chip, it will come back and bite you, and you have to just be very patient. What you want are those, you know, little um, thin, yeah. little thin things that are all over everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you using carbide? Which tool are you using, Mike? Uh, it's a, a um, spindle gouge. Now you're going to use the same tools. Remember, this is half wood, half plastic. The wood turns mostly like wood, except it's very hard wood because it's been plasticized. And the plastic is very soft wood, except it will chunk if you overrush it. It's a, a Kelton scraper, which for some reason I find to be the best overall tool working with these hybrid blanks. I think the mass of it is such that you can't over, you can't rush the cut. You see, we're now back to the, the spindle gouge. And so do you always use the plastic, the cactus juice on stuff you're doing? With yeah, it, it, it just, it just binds better. It just binds better. Now the, the wood is not as fun to turn because it makes it a little more brittle. Um, that's when you learn to appreciate your face shield real well. And that's one of the things I want to talk about here. Let me get done. You're doing it about the same way it's speed as you would for yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, the thing about alumilite is it turns very much like wood, unlike epoxy, as we saw. Um, and it doesn't make ear rending noises the way we heard. Um, it turns very much like wood. 
it will get warm if you if you you know if you if you if you turn wood for too long it will get hot too um to actually distort the aluminite with heat you've got to get it pretty warm much hotter than you would in a normal turning and what we're going to do now is the thing everyone loves to do we're going to sand <laughs> somewhere in here i say something about Every time I do this, I think of my seventh grade shop teacher, Mr. Wells. Yeah. He, and he said, you always wet sand plastic. And I wanted to send him a copy of this and say, look, see, I was awake. I did listen. I wet sanded it. We'll take after about the first, um, first course to get any of the little pinholes out of the plastic. We're now going to the, the, um, the shop rolls, the the um, cloth back, walnut oil as as a sanding lubricant. What did you start with? I started actually at eighty, which is a little hmm. more coarse than I would normally. But you want to make sure that that sometimes you don't see all of the little pinholes. You want you want to make sure you get them out of there. And after that, um, seven thousand. No, actually, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Yeah, um, the diatomaceous earth superseded what's in this. Uh, there's a a jab at at Kirk to hear at the end of this, but you won't be able to hear it. So anyway, so we're going up through um, the cloth backs to 800, and then to the the the, uh, um, the wet dry papers from a thousand up to about seven thousand and it leaves you a pretty nice uh the plastic becomes very clear lucid very nicely finished you clean it off um in the early days i used to to finish put a top coat of pens plus on it i found that actually if you just leave, let the let the surface speak for itself you're going to be better off. It's not going to pick up fingerprints as badly. And if it does, you just wipe it off. So 8,000, uh, go to seven or 8,000 with the, um, um, the papers, the lubricant. You can, you can buff it if you want. Um, if you're going to, if you've gone to 7,000, there's no point starting in Tripoli. That's backtracking. That's only about a 5,000 grit abrasive. But the white diamond is a very nice last coat. What's that, about 10,000? Yeah, 10 or 12, something like that. When do you use water versus walnut oil? I use walnut oil because I always got it there. Uh, he has, he has, a, he has a, a 55 gallon drum. I've got it, I got it by the 55 gallon drum, yeah. You can use water because the wood has been plasticized. You can use water on that stabilized wood and you're not going to raise the grain. All, all the way up. And then if you were to do the top of the diamond, you just put a little bit on that. I'll put it on a buffing wheel. Uh, probably the walnut oil. I see a white rag. Okay, so now that that's done, we'll fit it, fix it, put it in the. Uh, well, we're still sanding. God, come on, Mike, hurry up. Well, I do see people. I've never done this, but on the internet, you'll see them using a piece of something with grid in it. That's yeah, it's it. We step. no, we know it is mode. Uh, it's it's a wax with some sort of abrasive in it. The same kind of stuff they use on headlights, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So you don't do that. Well, actually, we do, and we'll I'll, I'll show you at the end. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I know. God. Hey, what? In the interest. 
Well, you can see that shine coming up. And that's, that's one of the fun things about working with the plastics is when they start to shine, they, they just kind of shout at you. Hey, look at me. <laughs> and that's blue. That's 5,000. I can tell by the back of the paper. So we are coming to an end. There we go. All told, 20 minutes maybe. But that way you were just cleaning up the stuff. Yeah, just getting the stuff off. But you can see the you can see the interior design. There we go. Ta-da. Uh, right. Yeah, you, you cut the threads in, and that's how you hold it on the chuck. And then it just is ready to go off on the other one. Yeah. That's that's one of those that I actually... That's the one that I didn't turn for the Salem Club. I brought it home and decided to do this. The other... Back in the... you know, There are, there are very few original ideas. The idea of putting an abrasive in a paste... You know, the first time I was told, a guy named Bill Hall from uh, Salt Lake City, he taught a class on ma making Native American flutes that I took. He was the first one I ever saw do it. Huh? Well, that's a good idea. If you want to, you can buff it. Don't start with Tripoli. Go straight to the, the white diamond. You can buff with the wax if you want. But to get a little more abrasion, you can use pumice and rotten stone. Now, you can go to Woodcraft and buy a tin of that and split it with all your friends, and you'll never, ever, any of you run out of it because you use such a small amount. The 4F fine is equivalent to the pumice your dentist uses to polish your teeth. The rotten stone is literally rotten granite. It's granite that's fallen apart into this dust-like material that uh, makes a wonderful abrasive. It's using a quality paste wax. Your face wet. Yeah, little on a towel, little what pumice. Rotten, rotten stone is about twenty thousand, and you know I used to carry around salt shakers with pumice and rotten stone. Now I carry around a salt shaker with diatomaceous earth. It will do the same thing better, and it works just as easily. Just a little little diatomaceous earth in your pad of paste wax, and that will polish whatever you want to a very nice shine. But I did this actually after you know the the last wood show that we had out at, at the uh, the expo center. Uh, Craft Supplies was right next to the Northwest Woodturners booth, and they had us helping uh, people come by turn pens. And so I, I took my wax down there and my, you know, and, and we were using that to finish the pens. And Kirk DeHere was there. Six weeks later, we get Dr. Kirk's miracle polishes. <laughs> so, he ripped you off. And, you know, there, there are no good ideas, no new ideas. Someone <laughs> else, I got it from someone else, he can have it from mine. I don't mind him pirating the idea. I do mind him pirating the degree. That's it. So not a doctor. No. Okay. I think the last the last of it is it says, and you can trust me because I I'm I am a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I have master's degree. <laughs> And the last, the last slide that you would have seen says, uh, excuse my dig on Kirk to hear. Thank you for your attention. I think we'll call it a quits right there. Um, are there any questions? As any questions from the uh, Zoom crowd? Um, live, uh, for, uh, audio on the website. <laughs> <laughs> One might hope. Along with the PowerPoint. Yeah. Anyway.
How many rivals have you developed in the, the wind turning products world these days? I don't know. You know, I I get along with Mahoney real well. Uh, Is that a dime? No, it's not. If it was a dime, I'd have picked it up. Um, Skip was going to go for it, too. <laughs> no, Mahoney, I get along with real well. Is we did have one little set too, and and he understood at the end that he knew nothing about the chemistry of walnut oil, how it worked, why it worked, why you do certain things, and I said, look, you're a great turner, but you're a shitty chemist, so <laughs> stay out of my lane, and I'll stay out of yours, <laughs> and we we get along fine. So the diatomaceous earth. Are you using anything special or no. chicken feed? Just the the calcium supply diet to Mesha's Earth, the stuff you get for your garden. And it 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 works so well because it, it starts out, you know, the little diatoms, it's it's about oh seven or eight thousand grit abrasive. But as you put pressure on it, the shells break down. It gets finer and finer and finer. That's why it gets hot. And you can just you can just see the the, the surface get get better. It works really well. You know what diatomaceous earth is really good for? Spray it around your plants because the slugs hate it. Oh yeah, yes. They sort of dehydrate when you <laughs> when they go over it. Cuts their little feet. Yes, it does. Don't buy so, it. a ten pound bag. Wow. You, <laughs> you know, I I, two, I I bought a two pound bag years ago. I still got most of a two pound bag. <laughs> is they you know if if you ever want to get ambitious, the stuff that I make is called Mode Mineral Oil Diatomaceous Earth. It's half walnut oil or half mineral oil by volume, um, a quarter of the volume wax and a quarter of the volume diatomaceous earth. And you just put it on it, mix it up in a pan and pour it into a can. Now, the trick is, let me ask about the, the, the mica dropping. The diatomaceous earth will settle out, and which is why I couldn't figure out a way to actually bring it into production for a product because it, it works great. So what I do is I'll put all my little tins in the freezer and free get them cold, then pour the pour the, the mixture into the cold tins, and the tin chills it and it stops the, the diatomaceous earth from settling to the bottom. Then I put it back in the freezer. I don't know if so is this the same type of recipe that there's a guy, um, Mike Peace, makes a an abrasive paste? With um, beeswax and diatomaceous earth. Yeah, that's the guy out of Atlanta. Right? Yeah. yeah. Is this the same con consistency or grit? It, you know, for your formula for an abrasive, which is what this would be. Um, the beeswax is not such a problem. On the whole, I'm not keen on beeswax as a finishing material because it, on exposure to air, it will turn to a white dust. Now, if you mix your beeswax with about a quarter by weight, any other wax, paraffin, carnauba, any other wax, it will stop that powdering. Um, but it works okay, you know. Tried to make a paste with uh, walnut oil and uh, beeswax and pumice and it walnut oil seemed to polymerize and it turned into this crumbly mess. Mm -hmm. Not good. No. Now there's it. Hmm? I had one of his original uh, tapes, and he was making a box. He likes beeswax. Well, a lot of people like beeswax. That's that's fine. I'm not one of them. Uh, I love to hear that it's got right because they think, oh, geez, beeswax, all natural. <laughs> the bees died to make that for you. So come on. Now, well, beeswax is the only wax made to do And as a consequence, consequence it has an oxygen leakage. It has an oxygen ether leakage right in the middle of the long arms. That ether is exposed to oxygen in the air and it breaks. And it changes the properties of wax. It's no longer wax. It's sort of a. Um, so if you mix it with mineral oil or anything else. Yeah, yeah I, I started making it with more than one, but I, you know, I realized that. I, I, I don't, don't want you to just step on the surface. I want this to be able to just carry. So, so mineral oil is not going to memorize this way. You can mix it up and evaporate. But it'll carry the wax and it'll carry the diatomaceous earth. 
So, so it, it, it formed the bulk of this material. And get out of the way when you get off. Have a butcher block wax that you can get in a store, whatever sure. brand name of it. Oh, I think right. it's mineral oil and beeswax. Mineral oil and beeswax, sure. And, and a little carnauba, I think, in there. Yeah. Wooden, uh, uh, butcher blocks and my wooden utensils, and I've never seen the white powder. Uh, the, the, the white powder, powder was in the center. Somewhere. Somewhere. with Johnson's face wax. Huh? Johnson's. Well, well the solid solvent and the barrel in ether. Um, that's, that's Johnson's face wax, wax is mostly uh, paraben. Really? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it, 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 it may well be, and it can be, the wood is, is absorbing. Enough, enough of the things, things that are going to generate, generate the powder that it doesn't turn to powder. And it also could be that it's not really beeswax. And I generally wipe them down too after it's soaked in a little bit. Yeah. Now, now the, do you guys know, do you know, do you know, know the, the story, story of the butcher block? How the mineral oil came to be a wood, a wood finish? Back, Back in the old days. days. Yeah, I was going to say he kept it, basically, he kept the wood soft with it. Yeah, yeah he kept, kept, it, kept it clean. Back, Back in the old days, days, the butcher would pack away on the butcher block all day. End, End of the day, day he would take um, what's, what's the, the tool that you use to cut the to cut, cut the, the seat out, out of the chair? Scorp. Scorp. It looks like, like a scorp because it's like, like this, this big. big. And he just scrapes the top of the wood off. He takes, takes all that wood, wood fiber, the muck, the beef, the lamb, anything that's left on the butcher block. He cleans that. And then he covers that with mineral oil. Now, the, the mineral oil is not doing anything for the wood. All it's doing is keeping bacteria and fungus from going down into the fibers. The next morning he comes in, takes the, the big blade, cleans all that off again, and goes about his, his business. So the, it was just a matter of keeping the garbage out of the butcher block. Then they started using mineral oil. They didn't use always the mineral oil back in the old, old days. It was water. He just needed, needed to cover it with some sort of fat that he could scrape off the next morning. I have a question that's just kind of vaguely related to this. And uh, we've gone through, through tonight. Vague is, is, is the, it's the operative word. Uh, <laughs> this is a situation I have with some green bowls. Mm -hmm. And I've turned them once, <clears throat> let them dry, and they cracked. And I'm wondering if there's a material I could use to fill the crack and turn it the second time that won't, won't fly out or... That's a big Can you repeat the question to the guys? Uh, there's a the question, question of uh, epoxy, maybe? Um, so some green bowls were turned and they dry the crack. And the question is, what can you use to fill the cracks to be turned? Um, you know, my go-to for for filling cracks is uh, epoxy and coffee grounds. <laughs> that was works. But CA, uh, C or CA glue works just fine. CA, they are pretty, sure it does. Yeah. pretty good sized cracks. I mean, they're like, uh, so they, they weren't, weren't that good with me, me but how big? <laughs> maybe five sixteenths somewhere at the top, so, and tapering down. To, mm -hmm. so you do use uh, CA glue, uh, use the thick. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. mix some of the sawdust in from the piece. Right. Of yeah. yeah. Mm. Yep. yep. Okay. And then the return to standard again, maybe it needs to be. Um, I was thinking of doing something to, so it wouldn't look like CA glue. You know, it would have some color. Uh, and you said it's sawdust or coffee grounds or mineral or um, uh, metal, metal shavings. Yeah. 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 Go to a hardware store and get, get a bunch of that brass heat and you can get it off the heat. What about dye? I mean, to make it. There, there are epoxy dyes that are made specifically for epoxy. Because yeah, I, yeah. I don't want it to look like I'm trying to match the what I want. Okay, okay so make it something uh, you know, contrast. I'm a yeah. copper powder. Looks really, really good, good, particularly with the garden wood. Yeah, copper powder and walnut looks really nice together with some thick. Yeah, yeah. see, mm -hmm. it polishes up to look like veins of gold. Yeah, yeah it does. Copper powder. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or you, or you get, get the brass, brass, the heat brass. That, that, that gets you the gold color. It'll, It'll turn, turn green, green, but it's polishing it turn to a grass color. Or what's cheaper out here? It grows on trees. Yeah. yeah. The real real solution is not have a crack to begin with. 
Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, I tried. I did all the, you know, I treated it and used the uh, the wax, the milk wax or whatever. Anchor the stuff anchor, that we used all there. Yeah, anchor seal. Anchor, anchor seal. seal. Yeah. And uh, so you, you turn, I don't put it on, you know, I put it in place. It's cool. So yeah, you dry. turn it green. Did, did you wax it again? I did. How thick did you turn it? Uh, I leave it about uh, three quarters to an inch thick. Okay, that's about right. It, this is uh, um, pear. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. there it is right there. There you go. So, so, there you go. Suddenly, suddenly, the knowing side. side. <laughs> it really varies. I have a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. And some of it, no cracks whatsoever. Yeah. But. Well, depends on how moist it was when you started. <laughs> yeah, it was soaking wet. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, guys. Yeah. All right. If you, if you look at the stuff, if you look at the, the these things I've brought, I'm really interested to see how this turns out. Because it was, admittedly, this is the main thing. Uh, I was going to say, that's that your hex mold must have just fit in your yeah. five gallon. It was, it was like, like, it was like, like sitting on a rack in the oven. You did the flat size that right exactly, exactly where they were, and it went to the bottom, and now, now I know, now I know the other limits of that method. And, and uh, I made another one, a green one, a little green uh, plastic in it. But I couldn't find it. I couldn't bring that to you. That's, that, that was, I think, a pretty good one. The, the, the red, red black one, those, those were all made out of the same big project here. Right? Right? Uh, and, and that, that turned out, out real well, well, so I don't know what I'll try to up again. So, so everyone on Zoom, thanks for hanging in there tonight. It was a, a challenge for, uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll have a uh, uh, we'll have this up on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as we get all the uh, everything working. So hey, thanks, hey. everyone. Good night, and we'll see you next Good time. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. So you'll let me know. Oh.